Hi, and welcome to Kids Ability's presentation on sensory processing, understanding the sensory world around you. Here is an overview of the presentation and what you'll be learning about today. What is sensory processing? The eight senses, how we react to sensory experiences, and then for each of these senses, how do they affect us and what can we do? Then we'll try and put it all together at the end, go over a few scenarios, but sir, I guess if you have questions, you'll have to save them and write them down and then ask your OT or get yourself signed up for the upcoming sensory clinics if you're one of our clients in our school year's program. Just a quick note, this workshop will cover general information for parents and caregivers. This information is for educational purposes only. For specific strategies, equipment recommendations, and assistance with your child's specific goals, please speak to an occupational therapist. What is sensory processing? Our bodies and the environment send our brains information through our senses. This information is processed and organized so that we feel comfortable, secure, and respond appropriately to particular situations and environmental demands. For example, if you were to walk into your house at the end of a work day, you might smell supper cooking, hear the dog barking to go outside, and then notice that your shoes are feeling tight on your feet. Your senses take in all the information and your brain receives this input. You select which sensory input you need to pay attention to, what is the most important stimulus. You might choose to respond first to the dog who needs to go outside, or perhaps your shoes are becoming intolerable. Why did you not notice that your feet hurt on the drive home? Your brain was able to notice the sensory information from your feet and hold off on bringing it to your attention until an appropriate time. This is an example of good so sensory processing. This is how it should happen. The eight senses. So OTs know and talk about eight senses, not just your traditional touch, vision, hearing, smell, and taste. We have three more senses that they didn't teach you about in elementary school. The first is the tactile system. That's our sense of touch. The second is our visual system. That's our sense of sight. The third is our auditory sense. This is our sense of hearing. The fourth is the olfactory sense. This is our sense of smell. The fifth is your gustatory sense, or your sense of taste. The sixth is our vestibular system, or your sense of movement and balance. The seventh is the proprioception system, our sense of body awareness and position. And the eighth is interoception, and this is our sense of internal body sensations. Don't worry, we're going to be learning about them all very soon. The visual on this slide is to help illustrate the importance of our senses and our ability to process sensory information correctly to develop other skills. Our senses and sensory processing provide the foundation for higher level skills. So if you want, you can take a minute to pause this presentation and look at which senses and skills need to be developed at the bottom of this pyramid for higher level skills to flourish and thrive. This is why sensory processing matters. The way we react to sensory input happens on a continuum. If you look to the left of this slide, you'll see examples of what we call a low threshold for sensory input. These kids are what we sometimes call avoiders. They may avoid certain sensory events, for example, loud noises by covering their ears, or they may avoid intense movement activities like jumping or being upside down. They may be more sensitive, um, for example, more sensitive to the sensation of their clothing, sensitive to light touch, or getting their hands messy. When you see the words over-responsive or oversensitive, we're referring to the child who overreacts to stimulation. Another way to think of this is that they have a tiny cup and only a little bit of sensation um, overflows that cup. They only need a little bit of an, a sensation to generate a response. So this can look in two different ways, fear or anger. Signs of over-responding, being sensitive or avoiding sensory input can look like covering ears, avoiding certain textures, not liking to get messy, poor tolerance with haircuts or hair brushing, and picky eaters. So moving away from our low threshold kids over to the right side of the continuum and the right side of the slide, we have the high threshold. These are kids we sometimes call seekers. They may seek out more movement, more touch than other children. They may also have difficulty registering sensory information, meaning they, miss, miss, they may miss pertinent information or need a more stimulating environment in order to attend and participate. When you see the words under-responsive or seeking, we're referring to the child who needs more stimulation in their daily routines. A child at this end of the continuum can present in two main different ways. You see a little picture of Tigger there. <laughs> this is what we might call a seeker. They have a higher activity level, they might like to touch everything, and they might smell or put everything in their mouth. If we go back to that analogy of the tiny or the big cup, these guys have a big cup, but they're actively trying to fill it with more, more, more sensory input. Then we also have the Eeyore. 
Now, an Eeyore might be more someone who looks like they're tuning out and kind of under-responsive. They may have a high pain tolerance. They might not notice when their face is dirty. They don't seem aware of very high or low temperatures. And they might intrude into someone else's space. So again, going back to that big cup, little cup analogy, Eeyore still has a big cup and it's empty, but they're more passive in getting those needs met and they need help to fill the cup to generate a response and respond appropriately. The ability to move from either end of this continuum to be just right is called self-regulation. When reflecting on how we react to sensory events, it's very important to remember that every nervous system is unique. People can be a tigger for one type of sensory input, but respond with fear for other types. For example, your child may seek out more movement than other children, meaning they're a tigger for movement activities, but they are very sensitive to loud noises in active environments, making them a fear for auditory input. We are going to delve into each of the eight senses and how we typically react to these sensations. Remember that every nervous system is unique, so although we are about to discuss what's typical, not everyone's going to respond or feel this way. So there's no right or wrong way to respond to sensory input. However, if function and daily routines, activities, or learning is impacted, we can support those diff sensory differences. So let's get started. We all do things throughout our day to alter our environment or to provide our bodies with sensations or input to help regulate our attention, behavior, and our arousal level. Often, we may not even know what we're doing uh, or that we're doing these things at all, or are able to acknowledge how it is impacting our behavior or our ability to make sense of the world around us. So let's take a minute to consider the following and what your sensory preferences are by looking at the sensory tool survey on the next slide. I hope you took a minute to look this over um, and I'll share with you a couple of my own sensory tools or sensory preferences that I've realized as I look back um, on my own needs and learning more about sensory processing. So if you look at number five, it says, when I need to read or study, I prefer to. Um, and I remember being in university and when I needed to study and I'd get out to the library, that I either needed a perfectly quiet room with no noise whatsoever, um, but if there happened to be people nearby chatting, I would need to drown them out with kind of like a white noise or a constant noise of music. So it was kind of funny that how um, I could deal with noise, but only if it was constant. Um, and I would get pretty uh, irritated with anyone chatting nearby. Um, and if you look at number seven, when I need to listen at a meeting, I usually find myself, um, and here I'd probably say if I catch myself kind of I'm getting sleepy and I need to stay awake, I probably will be found doodling or shifting my position pretty frequently, um, crossing my legs, uncrossing my legs, using movement to stay awake. Um, and you know, here's where I often like to share too with a lot of parents that if we think hard enough, we can usually find um, that we have what I call a sensory quirk. Um, and for me, my sensory quirk is that I cannot handle the texture of a peach. Just the thought of touching a fuzzy peach gives me shivers up and down my spine. Um, so again, when I said earlier that there's no right or wrong way to respond uh, to sensory input, sometimes there are differences and we just have to work with them. So for me, if I want a peach, someone has to peel it for me or I eat canned peaches. Is it impacting my function? No, because I've come up with strategies on how to deal with it. All right, now let's dive into our sensory systems. We'll start with touch. We receive touch information from the receptors in our skin and our mouth. Touch receptors help us identify light touch, deep pressure, vibration, temperature, and pain. The tactile system helps us understand where our body is in space, or body awareness, and helps us create a plan and carry out that plan to do things, or what we call motor planning. Now let's talk about how touch affects us. Now in general, I also wanted to kind of make a quick note that our responses to sensory input in the environment are largely dependent on kind of evolutionary and biological responses that are beneath our awareness. So for example, on this slide, you can see that we say that light touch generally creates a fight or flight reaction in our brain. And this is programmed in because if you think back in the day when the cavemen were around and they needed to be on high alert for predators or creepy crawlies, poisonous spiders, and attuned to small changes in their environment and around their bodies. So that's why when you kind of feel something crawling up your back, you're gonna respond in a big way. 
um, while as deep touch is tend to be calming for our nervous system and tends to release feel good chemicals in our bodies and our brain. Think of a nice deep massage and how great you feel after that. Now I want you to think back to that continuum we just talked about. Oversensitive, just right, or undersensitive when we're thinking about how touch affects us. So if children are sensitive to touch or avoiding touch, you might see things like difficulties with haircuts or having their nails trimmed, difficulties with bath time, difficulty getting their hands messy, difficulty with wet clothing, or picky with certain food textures. And remember too that this sensitive is where we see that kind of fear or anger response pop in. Some strategies quickly for these over-responsive kiddos um, are to establish coping and calming strategies to do beforehand. Sometimes we might use gradual exposure or gradual introduction to things that are a bit more alarming to them. Another great strategy is to use deep pressure touch rather than light touch. Um, for example, a big bear hug. Sometimes you might offer a towel or a napkin to wipe the hands clean when they're distressed. And a lot of times too, using a mirror can enhance that predictability when you need to provide touch for dressing. Um, and always it's a good idea for these kids to approach them from the front so that they're not surprised by any touch that's coming their way. Being able to predict um, an unpleasant input always increases the chance that they can tolerate it. Now we'll head over to that other side of the continuum um, where they are undersensitive to touch. Now these Tigger or Eeyores might look like those who are touching people and objects constantly. They might be messy eaters that don't realize when their face is messy. They might be the ones that chew inedible objects and not aware of personal space. So again, this is that big cup and they're looking for more input to fill it. In terms of strategies and suggestions for our under-responsive kiddos, um, visuals and social stories to teach them expectations around personal space can be helpful. Using a mirror to prompt the child and just including more touch activities to help fill that cup. Sensory bins with oatmeal, lentils, dry pasta, sand, mud. Playing with foam soap or shaving cream at bath time. Playing with Play-Doh. Textured storybooks. A fidget toy for circle time, meal times, transitions, or waiting times. Bubbles. Toys that vibrate. Uh, vibrating teethers or toothbrushes. Or playing with stretch or bendable toys. Next up is vision. And we receive visual information with our eyes. Children learn to coordinate their eyes with their hands, feet, and body movements. Vision works with the other sensory systems, like the senses of movement, body position, and how this provides more information. For example, how far something is away, how big of a step we need to take to clear that gap, or how hard we need to throw something based on how far our eyes tell us it is. And then moving into how does our visual input impact our behavior and arousal? In general, bright and fast moving things tend to wake us up and alert most people. So do highly contrasting colors. While on the other hand, neutral or cool colors and slow moving visual input tend to be relaxing and calming. For a more specific example of bright and fast moving, if we come back to that evolutionary and biological response, if you see a big strobe light or a siren on a vehicle, you know that that visual input is telling you to be on high alert. Whereas if you looked at something like on the slide here, like a slow lava lamp, you can think about how relaxing and calming that might be. When considering how vision affects children who are sensitive or avoiding visual input, um, that fear or anger response, our tiny cup, we might see children who are easily overwhelmed by a busy environment, bothered by bright lights, more happy in the dark, and distracted to movement and activity in the room. Some strategies or activities to consider for these children um, would be minimizing distractions in the environment, um, keeping in mind their child's preference of lighting, or using dimmed lighting. Also considering having a hideout, say in a busy classroom, if the child's feeling overwhelmed, like a tent to limit the visual input. And heading back over to that right side of the continuum with our Tigger and Eeyore, those who are under sensitive to input, they might have difficulty fighting, finding items on a busy background. They might like to watch bright or fast moving things, and they always might like to watch people move around the room. Some strategies and activities for those who have that big cup and are under responsive to visual input might be to play games like I Spy or look at Where's Waldo books. You might make sure you're doing games that involve hand-eye coordination like catch. You might try things like Simon Says or using a visual marker to define a child's seat or place of the carpet. You might use more visual cues like a visual schedule to help them tune in to what's happening. You might try increasing the contrast of materials. Consider labels to help children locate certain items and be sure to minimize visual clutter, eliminating busy patterns. Next up is hearing. We receive auditory information in the ears. Tuning in and tuning out to sound of certain sounds is essential to the development of communication and listening. 
And when we talk about communication, we are referring to both verbal and nonverbal communication, including gestures, eye contact, and body language. Infants need to be able to tune into the voices and actions of adults around them to begin developing communication skills like eye contact and imitation. So how does hearing affect us? In general, loud, high-pitched, unexpected sounds tend to wake us up or alert us. Again, coming back to that evolutionary perspective um, and our brain functions, loud can mean danger. It means that it needs your attention right now. Well, on the other hand, soft sounds, sounds with gentle rhythm, low tones, and simple melodies tend to be relaxing and calming. You're not gonna listen to heavy metal right before you need to go to bed. Some people will have preferences of intermittent noise versus constant noise, like I mentioned I did, um, needing that quiet place to study or white noise. Um, and a lot of babies enjoy that white noise for sleep as well. Now thinking about how hearing affects our behavior and arousal, um, for those children who are sensitive on that left side of the continuum with their tiny cup, um, they might cover their ears or be upset by loud noises or environments. They might react strongly to unexpected noises and might be distracted easily by noisy environments or background noise. Some strategies and activities for our fear and anger kiddos might to have a hideout for overwhelming times, to have noise canceling headphones on hand to block out unwanted auditory input, to be cautious of the volume of your own voice while speaking to them, allowing your child to cover their ears as they need to, always preparing them for loud noises if possible, telling them, I'm about to turn on the vacuum now, or there's going to be a fire drill in five minutes, and reduce background noises. In general, for kids who are sensitive, predictability in general and preparing them for unpleasant input is always helpful. And for children on the other side of that continuum, the Tigger and Eeyore, who is undersensitive to auditory input, they may not seem bothered by auditory input or they're missing important auditory information in their environment. They might like sound, music, and background noise. They may make noise constantly, or they might tune you out when you call their name or not be able to hear their name above the busy drone of a classroom. Some strategies and activities for them would be to use musical toys or toys with sounds, Use changes in volume of your voice to increase their attention, to see if they notice the difference between the whisper and talking louder. To use songs when possible, for example, a cleanup song, so that the music lets them know what the transition's going to be. And then you may need to get down on their level, make eye contact, and touch their arm to get their attention. In general, if they are undersensitive in this sense, we might engage their other senses to get their attention before giving them a verbal message they need to listen to. So support their understanding with verbal, visuals, pictures, or gestures. Next is smell and taste. We receive taste and smell information with receptors in our mouth and nose. Some quick facts about these uh, senses is that oral, oral motor activities, for example, chewing gum or sucking on candy, help regulate our bodies. And smells can bring us back to a very specific time, which may be harmful for some. It is highly linked to memory. So in general, how do taste and smell affect our behavior and arousal? In general, sour, cold, spicy, bitter, hot, and bad smells wake us up that increase our arousal. So if we go back again to our evolutionary kind of perspective, um, you want to make sure that you are smelling and tasting things uh, that might have gone bad or are not safe for you to eat or are poisonous. And then on the other hand, sweet, bland, savory, warm, room temperature tend to have less of an effect, similar to soft, sweet smells. They call them comfort foods for a reason. And when we think about how children who are oversensitive to this type of input might behave or react, we might notice that they notice all odors or tastes that others do not. They notice small changes in tastes, and these might be our picky eaters. So some strategies or activities to consider might be removing scented soap, lotions, and detergents. Consider mildly flavored foods, and consider the temperature of the food, warm but not hot. And then how do taste and smell affect those children who are undersensitive? They might be unaware of pleasant odors. They might lick or taste inedible objects. They might prefer spicy or hot foods and smell everything in their environment. They might be seeking out these tastes and smells because, or not noticing tastes or smells that most people do. Some strategies and activities for them to meet the needs of their big cup might be to use scented markers or scented Play-Doh or a variety of flavors and spices in food. If I had to pick a favorite sensory system or the one that I think is the coolest, it would be this next one, the vestibular system. It is an extremely important system. It's the strongest input we can give the brain with long-lasting effects. This system is linked to several of our other sensory systems and works together with them to help us make sense of our environment. For example, think about how you might feel if you were to stand up and spin around right now. How long would it take you to feel better again? 
we receive information about gravity and movement in the receptors in our inner ear. If you've ever had an ear infection or an inner ear issue, then you know how greatly your balance was affected and probably are intimately aware of how this system helps you with that. The vestibular system tells us if we are moving, what direction we're moving in, what speed we're going, what our head position is in, and if objects are moving around us. It allows us to accurately use our vision to prepare our posture, maintain our balance, plan our actions, move, calm ourselves, and regulate our behaviors. And all of these things are just with one sensory system. Mind-blowing, right? Now do you see why it's so important? Vestibular input to the brain is often referred to as turning the lights on in the brain. Because of the connections between vestibular system and our auditory system, it also plays an integral role in language processing and production. So how does vestibular input impact our behavior and arousal? People's reactions to vestibular input vary, but typically, symmetrical and repetitive or rhythmic movement is relaxing and calming. Think of lying in a hammock or a rocking chair. While fast or spinning movement wakes us up, spinning, roller coasters, all very exhilarating. Uh, or do you like being upside down? Quick facts about the vestibular system. Typically, we are more capable of learning when our bodies are moving. Moving, Movement increases our attention. And in general, there are so many studies that show lately we think better in standing than sitting. A good chunk of our brain turns off just by sitting. Any type of movement will stimulate the vestibular receptors, but spinning, swinging, and hanging upside down provide the most intense, longest lasting input. A word of caution about the vestibular system and vestibular activities before we go on. As I was saying, the vestibular stimulation can have a significant impact on your nervous system. Vestibular activities must be supervised carefully to watch for signs of overload. Negative responses can include excessive yawning, hiccuping or sighing, irregular breathing, color change or pallor, sweating, increased anxiety, pupil dilation, changes in sleep and wake patterns, significant changes in overall arousal, for example, falling asleep or giddiness. If you see any of these signs, stop immediately. It's very important to remember that vestibular input can often be alerting and disorienting. Adding the element of turning the head upside down can lead to extreme disorientation of the nervous system for children, and this type of input can contribute greatly to sensory overload. We're learning more about how much of this input is good and where to find the benefits of it, and some research is showing that 10 to 23 spins is a good amount, kind of random. But less is not enough, but more can be too much, um, and it's very difficult to gauge. So if you're experimenting with these intense forms of vestibular input and activities, it's best to do so in coordination with an occupational therapist, and always, always, always go slow and observe. So going to look at how do we respond to vestibular input. So children on that oversensitive side of the continuum who might respond in fear and anger uh, may not like movement activities. They might appear sluggish, avoid different movements, and may avoid changes in head position, for example, right on toys or being upside down. Some strategies for these kids who are oversensitive and have that tiny cup that overflows would be to gradually introduce movement activities, start with proprioceptive exercises first as they're more regulating for our bodies, and you'll see more of that in the next few slides and to provide choices to ensure the activity is child-driven and predictable. And when looking at how vestibular impacts a child who is undersensitive to movement and gravity, uh, they may be the ones that are seeking out more movement than others and under-responsive to certain movements. They might crave intense movement, they might be moving constantly, they may love being upside down, and they might be crawling, climbing all over the place. Some strategies or activities to build into their day to meet their needs could include jumping, bouncing, like doing jumping jacks or bouncing on a large ball, swinging, spinning, rocking, climbing at the park, using riding toys, walking, running, or sports, hanging upside down, uh, monkey bars or yoga, doing downward dog, doing bear crawls, doing different animal walks during transitions from one activity to another, giving them body breaks to move and stretch, and using what we call active seating which is often done best with a coordination and direction from an occupational therapist. Um, and those might be things like a little move and sit cushion, which is an inflatable cushion that goes under their seat to give them some wiggle, or a tool called a hockey stool. You can ask your OT about these. All right, now we'll talk about my second favorite sense, proprioception. This is another very important sense that can also have a very powerful effect on our bodies. We receive proprioceptive input in the receptors that are in our muscles and joints. The proprioception system tells us where our body parts are positioned, their position in relation to each other, people and objects, and how much strength and force to use. Proprioception 
proprioception equals heavy work. For example, how hard you need to press your paper, uh, how hard you need to press your crayon or pencil on the paper, or how, hold, or, or how hard you need to hold that pencil, how far to throw a ball, picking a heavy versus light object. It also plays a huge role in developing a body scheme or map that we memorize and use to develop motor planning abilities. Dysfunction in this sense has a very significant impact on calmness, focus, and coordination. So how does proprioception impact us, our behavior, and arousal? It can alert us or calm us, depending on the situation. This is the only sense where it's a bit more confusing, and working with an OT can be extra helpful. It tends to be regulating in general. It may increase those feel-good chemicals like serotonin in the body, which creates a calming effect, and it's rarely, if ever, overloading for the body. My favorite expression is, when in doubt, use deep pressure. It's good for seekers and sensitive kids, movers and crashers, good for children who are active and on the go, good for children who are uncoordinated and clumsy, good for children who have difficulty planning movements, good for kids who have difficulty paying attention, and good for kids who have difficulty calming their bodies. And again, like it says at the bottom, when in doubt, do heavy work. And a bit more in detail. Um, so deep pressure is calming. When you're aware of your body, you feel more secure and that nervous system is happy. For example, imagine yourself sitting here trying to concentrate on this discussion and you find yourself getting sleepy. You might instinctively stand up and stretch to help wake yourself up. Try and stand up now and see how you feel. The stretch you provided to your muscles helps to increase your arousal and allows you to better concentrate on the task at hand. This is proprioceptive and vestibular systems working together. Other examples of proprioception activities that we all may use to help self-regulate are chewing gum, tapping our feet, or fidgeting with a pen in your hand. Children who are under-responsive to this type of input may require more movement and more touch to stay alert and organized compared to their peers. Children may be so motivated to move that it's hard to maintain attention for any length of time. This desire to move can compromise their ability to attend and learn new skills. So here, let's discuss a few proprioceptive activities and whole body activities um, that can be provided throughout the day and, or built into the day as needed to give those kids what they need. Um, pushing a grocery cart or toy shopping cart, stacking or moving books or grocery items, pulling a wagon or a tug of war, helping clean, raking, brooming, mopping, scrubbing. Often kids love this helper role and it's so great to used to build in proprioceptive or heavy work activities and great for their self-esteem and regulation as well. You can also try playing in sand, shoveling and building, jumping activities, push-ups on a wall or chair push-ups, bear crawling and crab walking, catching and throwing a large ball, kicking a ball, squishing and hugging a pillow or a stuffy, stretches, deep pressure like a big hug, weighted items which should often be used always with supervision and direction from an OT and compression items again to be used with supervision or direction from an OT. Some deep pressure or weighted items include things called cozy clothes, weighted vests, compression vests, weighted lap pads, weighted blankets, adding weight to a backpack, a body sack, body sock, lycra material, an inflatable pea pod, a beanbag chair or a large therapy ball. These are often best introduced or consulted with an OT for. Some proprioceptive activities that are great for the hands include Play-Doh, clay, silly putty activities, um, a stress ball, a squishy ball for the hands, pushing your hands and pulling the fingers, or pulling apart resistive toys like Lego, squigs, or snap beads. On the top left of the slide, you can see therapy putty. And on the top right of the slide, you can see what are called squigs. These are one of my favorite toys, and I actually use them at home with my children all the time. They're little suction um, pieces of different shapes that can either stick together and stick to flat surfaces like glass, windows, um, baking trays, or shiny tabletops, um, and we're really, really great for some heavy work. Some proprioceptive activities for the mouth include blowing bubbles in a cup through a straw, playing with bubbles, sucking through a straw, you could also try a curly straw to increase that input, chewing crunchy or chewy foods, deep breathing, um, truelery or chewable toys, um, always used with supervision, um, and musical instruments that involve, involve blowing, like a harmonica or a recorder. Now we've come to the eighth and final sense, interoception. This is the awareness and perception of sensory information from our internal organs to our brains like hunger, thirst, bladder fullness, or heart rate. It's kind of a, the, the newest of the senses to join the scene, and there's very limited research to date, but new information keeps emerging all the time. 
We don't know a ton about it yet, so strategies are limited, but it's always good to consider how these internal states are influencing our behavior and arousal. So right now, sit back and close your eyes. What do you feel inside your body? Is your heart beating fast or slow? Are you breathing deeply or shallowly? Do you have to go to the bathroom? Are your muscles tense or loose? How does your stomach feel? Most of us are able to feel all these sensations with the help of this little known but very important eighth sensory system. When the interoceptive system is properly working, the sensations alert us that our internal balance is off and motivates us to take action, to do something that will restore the balance and help us feel more comfortable. For example, if we feel thirsty, we get a drink. If we feel full, we stop eating. If we feel cold, we get a sweater. If we need to urinate, we go to the bathroom. If we feel anxious, we seek comfort. If we feel frustrated, we seek help. Interoception underlies our urge for action. If we feel that our internal balance is off, we are motivated to act to seek immediate relief from the discomfort caused by the imbalance. Often kids with sensory processing difficulty have significantly lower awareness of their interoceptive signals. For example, not feeling hungry or difficulty with toilet training due to poor awareness of a full bladder. Less often, kids may have heightened interoception and may be overly sensitive to internal body functions, making it hard to move on and focus if they're only somewhat hungry or somewhat constipated. Now, we've covered all the senses, let's bring it all together. We can all have sensory processing difficulties sometimes. You might find that if you're tired, sick, or stressed, that your ability to tolerate other senses and sensations is really decreased. However, most of us have learned to seek and avoid sensations to help maintain and organize ourselves to help ourselves feel just right. Just like I will not touch a peach because I know that will not be good for my arousal. A lot of children with sensory processing difficulties do not yet have the tools for self-organization. So what do we do? You need to be a sensory detective. When are they most calm? When are they most engaged? When are they the most active? Please enjoy this clip and summary of what was discussed today from the perspective of a child. Everyone has seven sensory systems. They are sound, taste, smell, vision, touch, proprioceptive, and vestibular. Under-responsive versus over-responsive. You can think of each of your sensory systems as being a cup. And water is that type of a sensory input. If you are under-responsive to a certain sensory input, it is like you're a big, huge cup. You keep getting water to the big cup. You can just keep adding and adding, but it never feels full. But if you are over-responsive, it is like you are a tiny cup. All you need is just a little sensory input and you overflow. You want your cup to be full and not spill over. Each of your sensory systems is their own cup and they are different sizes. Just because you have one big cup does not mean you are under-responsive with all your senses. I have a big cup for my proprioceptive and vestibular senses and a little cup for my touch, sound, taste, and smell senses. Everyone is a different and unique. Let's review a few scenarios to kind of flex those sensory detective muscles and see if you could think of some strategies. So scenario one, your child is busy and on the go this morning. He or she is crashing and jumping on the furniture. How do we get them to sit down for breakfast? Take a minute to pause this and kind of brainstorm a couple strategies and ideas before listening to mine. So you might use a visual support like a sand timer. And then you could say you have five minutes for jumping because they clearly need to move their body. It's good sometimes to provide the input in a structured way so they know what to expect and when they might get what they need again. You might follow this up with some squeezes, a massage, a hot dog game where you roll them in a blanket or roll a therapy ball over their body or maybe let them have something weighted on their lap at the table. Scenario two, your child is getting dressed and you notice that he or she averts when you touch them lightly. You've also noticed that they've had a meltdown when they get their hands dirty outside or during mealtimes. Take a minute to think of some strategies or ideas. Did you think about my favorite expression, when in doubt, use deep pressure? Maybe you could also dress them in front of a mirror so touch is not a surprise. 
You can prepare body parts with deep pressure that are sensitive and make sure that you tell them what you're doing as you're about to do it. For example, you could say, I'm going to squeeze your hand now. Now I'm putting on your... Scenario three, you notice that your child covers their ears and becomes upset when they hear unexpected noises. For example, a fire siren. And when appliances at home are used, like a blender or a vacuum. Take a minute to brainstorm some strategies and ideas. First of all, you could let them try some noise cancelling headphones. I find too that sometimes for kids who are especially sensitive to sound, just knowing that they have a strategy can be calming enough for them to not actually need that strategy, so they don't feel so stuck or they, they don't have a plan. You might try some deep pressure before they know they need to hear something that's stressful, and you might be sure to make sure you give them a warning, I'm going to use the blender now or I'm going to do some vacuuming, again playing into that predictability for them. I've also learned a neat trick for kids who don't like the public uh, toilet that can kind of flush a bit unpredictability, predictable, um, is to bring post-it notes in your bag with you so you can put them over the sensor and keep it from surprise flushing. Some of those scenarios might have sounded like to your child and some of them might not. You might need more support from an occupational therapist. An OT can help determine the intensity, frequency, duration, and order of activities that they might need. They might help you develop a sensory diet or help you consider how sensory input would be beneficial in the flow of your child's day. They might do a sensory processing assessment and tailor strategies specifically to your child. And they might recommend, recommend specific sensory equipment that may work for some and not for others or that may result in more risk, like a weighted item or a compression garment. Sensory systems are very unique. There is no one size fits all and strategies need to be tailored to your unique child. Sometimes this may take a bit of trial and error, but it's all great information that tells us more about your child's unique system, whether a strategy happens to work or not. If you need some more support and you need to find an occupational therapist, you can contact Intake at extension 1214 at KidsAbility to determine your eligibility for OT support in the school years program. Um, for example, we have a sensory clinic or the early years program. Some children have an OT at their school. They can help them with school specific questions and equipment. And if your child has autism spectrum disorder, you can access private OT services using your childhood budget funding. Private occupational therapy options are available in the community, and you can visit www.coto.org, which is the College of Occupational Therapists of Ontario, to find a private OT in your community. Here are a few additional reading resources that were really helpful um, in continuing on your sensory journey, and these specific three are available in our resource centre. The last slide here is just some references of the research that we used to create this presentation. Um, I thank you very much for your time listening and please keep all those questions that you wrote down to speak with an occupational therapist.